Well, continued happy Easter to you in this 50-day Easter season uh, on this third Sunday of Easter. So that gospel we heard of the walk to Emmaus was the very same gospel passage we heard on the fourth day of Easter. Such a great story that I want to touch on it again and build upon that brief homily from Easter Wednesday when I focused on how Jesus was essentially celebrating the first post-resurrection Mass on that first Easter Sunday. But for today, I want to build more on how Christ appeared to them as the clandestine Jesus, so to speak. Because if you notice, both in the case of these two disciples walking to Emmaus and in the case of Jesus' prior appearance earlier that morning to Mary Magdalene, neither she nor the disciples recognized Jesus at first. All right, Jesus had some sort of Jedi mind trick going on uh, and that prevented them from realizing it was him, at least at first. And Mary Magdalene thought Jesus was the gardener at first until Jesus called out her name with that striking tone of familiarity, Mary. And these two guys in today's gospel, they were a little more dense, weren't they? Uh, when Jesus walked up to them, they thought he was uh, this clueless stranger who hadn't talked, uh, heard about what everyone was talking about, namely this Jesus of Nazareth, Nazareth, whom they had hoped was the Messiah. And they ended up walking the rest of those seven miles from Jerusalem to Emmaus with Jesus, who opened up the scripture passages that referred to him all the way back to Moses and the, and the prophets about the Messiah and how he would have to die for the redemption of God's people, but only to rise again and defeat death itself. So at what point did these two followers of Jesus finally recognize it was him? It wasn't until they got to Emmaus when something inside of them urged them to invite this clandestine Jesus to stay with them. But it wasn't until Jesus took what? Took bread said the blessing, broke it, and gave it to them, that they finally recognized him. And it's precisely at that moment that Jesus vanished from their sight. Why? Did Jesus really leave them at that moment? No. As St. John Paul the Great commented on this uh, passage, quote, Jesus' face would disappear, yet the Master would stay with them hidden in the breaking of the bread, which had opened their eyes to recognize him. End of quote. So since the earliest times of the church, the Eucharist has often been referred to as the breaking of the bread. On that first Sunday of the resurrection, Jesus made what he did at that last supper just three nights before abundantly clear, right? He would be bodily present to them in every time and place where the, through the breaking of the bread, wherever the Eucharist was celebrated. They had connected the dots, right? Suddenly what Jesus said all the way back in John 6 during his public ministry uh, about how unless you eat his very flesh and drink his blood, we would not have life within us, now it made sense. Jesus said he is the way, the truth, and the Life, and that life that is Jesus, is given to us and all generations henceforth, right? Through the breaking of the bread. But sadly, it's this bread of life that you, God's people, the church, are having to do without right now. So many of you are just yearning for the Blessed Sacrament. And it's a beautiful thing, actually, because it reveals your love for Jesus, that he indeed is your life. So many have expressed how this pandemic has woken them up to not taking the priceless gift of the Eucharist for granted. And that right there, not taking Jesus in the Eucharist for granted, and the increased desire to receive the body of Christ that comes with that absence, right, is one of the ways that God is bringing good out of this pandemic. Rightfully so, we should yearn for the Eucharist more than anything because the Eucharist is Jesus himself, body, blood, soul, and divinity. 
At the same time, and listen well, church, the Eucharist is not the only means by which God, Jesus in particular, makes himself known to us. The Eucharist and the sacraments are not the sole means by which God gives us his life-sustaining grace. Yes, the sacraments are the primary and normative means that God has established to impart his grace and divine life upon us. But the Holy Spirit blows where he wills, and so God is obviously not limited to the sacramental economy that he himself has established. And so until we once again have access, regular access to the primary and normative means, let's focus on those other means of sharing in God's divine life and being in his holy presence. What are they? I just want to mention uh, two of them in particular. Remember that God is omnipresent. Right? That is, he is present in and through all of his creation. And what does scripture say? In him we live and move and have our being. Right? That goes for all of creation. Everything has its being as is, and is sustained by uh, sustained in existence by God. Because God is goodness itself, beauty itself, truth itself, everything that is good, beautiful, and true in creation is charged with that divine spark, so to speak. All things good, true, and beautiful participate in Him who is goodness itself, beauty itself, truth itself. And that's why being in the beauty of nature can feel like a religious experience at times. And we experience God in a sense uh, not only when we behold the grandeur of the mountains or the beauty of a sunset at the beach, but when we behold humanity at its best, right? In those times when we see the goodness of one person helping another person in need, or when we see the darkness of deceit dissipating and giving way to the light of truth. In all of these varying situations, there is something divine. We feel a sense of the sacred because everything good, true, and beautiful is a reflection of God's goodness, truth, and beauty. Remember from the beginning that God saw all that he had made and called it good? Right? As the saying goes, the devil doesn't have his own clay. Evil can't create in the proper sense of the word. Right? The devil doesn't have his own clay. All evil or a fallen humanity can do is twist God's good and beautiful creation. And all evil and uh, a fallen humanity can do is order that creation or use it in a way in which it was not meant to be used. That's what sin is, right? The sullying of the goodness, truth, and beauty by which God created the world. So that's another way we can sense God's presence through his, through his creation. But there is an even more proximate or direct presence of God to which we can have access. It's a more real presence of God because through it we sense God not only by the effects of his works, but by his very spiritual presence, which is in each of us. Remember from the beginning that humanity is the crown of God's creation on earth. God made man, male and female, to be the imago dei, right? the very image of God. But not only are you and I made in the image and likeness of God, the sacraments of baptism and confirmation made each of us a temple of the Holy Spirit so that God's very own spiritual presence would reside within us. I mean, imagine that. The third person of the Holy Trinity abides in you and me which makes the human person super sacred, right? That Holy Spirit abiding in us gives us immortality and destines us to an eternal life with God, that e eternal exchange of love that is God. But here's the thing. Many of us have lost the significance of that gift of his divine presence, just as many have taken for granted God's special presence in the Eucharist, many of us, myself included, have taken God's presence within each of us 
for granted. If we didn't take it for granted, we would revere and respect ourselves and each other a lot more than we do. Let me repeat that, because we live in, a, in such a hypercritical world these days, tearing one another down. If we didn't take God's presence of the Holy Spirit within us for granted, we would revere and respect ourselves and each other a lot more than we do. This powerful mode of God's presence is often underdeveloped, underutilized in the lives of God's people because many do not take the time to experience it. Right? What do I mean by that, that we don't take the time to experience this mode of God's presence? Well, the primary access point of God's divine presence within us is the life of personal prayer. The way we enter into and experience God's divine presence within us more palpably and more regularly so that it actually has an effect in the way that we go about our everyday life and the way that we pre treat the people around us, whether they're loved ones or strangers, is by prioritizing a life of daily prayer. But when people hear that call to have daily prayer, so many people tune out and feel frustrated because they don't know where to start in having a fruitful life of prayer. And that's part of why Father Brian and I began live streaming, praying with the Padres, connecting with you each night at 8 p.m. during this stay-at-home order so as to help you build the habit of regular prayer. We also give you tips on the spiritual life and how to go deeper in prayer to share the and also to share the stories that you've been sending us uh, since I issued that Share Your Story Challenge on Easter Sunday uh, Mass so that we can hear hopeful news amidst these troubling times. Now during prayer with the Padres, we are primarily using the rosary for that prayer time. Not only because the rosary is a powerful prayer and Our Lady has appeared all over the world encouraging uh, that we pray it regularly, but also because it is an easy introduction into prayer. Right? The number one problem in people exp not experiencing God's presence in prayer is people don't pray. <laughs> they, pretty simple, right? The pe folks don't take enough time to pray. They think prayer is just you know, this one-way communication of tossing up a couple of Hail Marys, but then we neglect the most important part of prayer, and that is to receive from God what he wants to give us. See, God the Holy Spirit truly abides in us, and, but we're not even conscious to that reality. We have, we have to get acclimated to the way God communicates with us. As I mentioned on Friday nights, uh, praying with the Padres, it's a little like learning a foreign language. Right? It takes time. And it takes perseverance when it doesn't seem like we're getting anywhere, any, anything out of it at first. We're not understanding what's going on, this foreign banter that's going on, right? Because God doesn't speak to us in English, but by the movements of our heart and our mind and our spirit, like a foreign language, we simply have to expose ourselves to it for a while, even if we have no clue what, what's being said at first. But then as we learn to quiet our souls and get attuned to God's whispers, we begin sensing His divine presence in a profound way. And maybe it's even almost imperceptibly noticing the fruits of the Holy Spirit in our life, right? Love, peace, gentleness, joy, self-restraint, uh, all those. There's 12 of them, I think. And so that assurance that we get as we get acclimated to his voice, that assurance that he is with us no matter what, gives us confidence to live our lives on a different plane. One in which the world's troubles and our own personal struggle, struggles cannot sap our hope, that virtue of hope. Just to give you an example of how this prayer, regular prayer time has affected a young mom of three children under six, Parishioner Bethany Glinsky, I want to share just one quote from her Share Your Story testimony, which, by the way, I encourage you to listen to on our Facebook page if you missed it. Bethany said this, 
Quote, the biggest lesson I have learned through this experience is that you can have peace in the midst of a world full of trouble and fear. And when I turn to God and really hear Him, I find that peace and guidance which helps me to bring that peace into my family. End of quote. So, praying the rosary is just a simple way to give God room to do that, to impart his peace. Right? We, we make a distinction between meditative prayer and contemplative prayer, right? Meditative prayer is meditating upon the scriptures, for example, Lexio Divina, and meditating on the rosary, the mysteries of the Lord's life and Our Lady's life. But hopefully what meditative prayer does, which is good in and of itself, there's great fruit in just that alone. But hopefully it can also lead us to contemplative prayer where it's God, the Holy Spirit, that Holy Spirit that you received at baptism, the Holy Spirit that breathed upon the world and made it and create, made creation. That same Holy Spirit wants to speak and minister directly to you. Right? We have an omnipotent God. He can do that for each and every soul. Directly minister to us, to communicate himself to us, to have a heart to heart with us, to massage our soul. Right? And it's in this direct communication. It's pure gift, right? We can't earn it. There's no magic formula. But contempor- this is the prayer of the mystics. If we never give God time to work, we won't receive the therapy, the healing, the wisdom our souls need. So the rosary is is an introductory way of doing that, which enlists the aid of the one who can best teach intimacy and union with God, our blessed Mother Mary. And so in this time of pandemic, when we cannot receive the primary and normative means by which God shares his divine life through the sacraments, Let's prioritize, above all else, this other means of having communion with God, right? The spiritual communion of prayer. So we invite you to join Father Brian and I each night, you know, to begin that daily journey with God that goes deeper and that that the rosary kind of introduces us because we're giving God room so that you can, as Bethany said, really hear him, and thus find that peace and guidance which helps me to bring that peace into my family.